I am here with David Herbst, who is a partner at Manat, a law firm in Palo Alto. David, thank you for joining us here. Well, thank you for having me. So explain to me the situation, what, what's happening with this retroactive uh, reversal. Well, to, to put it in, in context, in, in the Internal Revenue Code, there's a provision that gives tax breaks for investment in qualified small business company stock. And certain, you know, many companies in Silicon Valley will meet this test at the time that they are taking an angel investment or venture capital investment in their early stages. Um, the, uh, uh, this tax break was, was also adopted by the state of, of California. In effect, when a company or an investor in, in small business company stock sells the stock after holding it for five years, part of the gain is excluded from income, or if they sell the stock and reinvest in other small business companies within a specific period of time, they don't have to pay any taxes on that gain. The gain, in effect, rolls over in, into that company. So it's, it's, it's a, uh, a provision both in the Internal Revenue Code and in the California uh, uh, Revenue and Taxation Code to provide a benefit for investors in small business companies, uh, startup type companies until they get up to $50 million in assets. And the only requirement here was that a company had to be based mostly in California? Well, that, that's, that's the difference between the, the, the federal statute and the California statute. The federal statute applies to in, in any investment in a, in a domestic uh, corporation, that's a C corporation. The California statute uh, has an additional requirement that the company be based primarily in California, that at least 80% of its assets be in California and 80% of its payroll be in California. And so this ad additional requirement uh, w was an incentive to get companies to, or in individuals in California to invest in California companies rather than companies in other, s other states in, in the United States. It sounds like this is something that might have really helped venture capital take flight here in you know Silicon Valley in California well I again it would it would be something that angel investors and, and VCs here in California would certainly take advantage of in 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 their portfolio company investments looking for companies that qualify for that uh, both the federal break and the California break you know it, I'm sure that that's not the highest thing on the on the VC investor list but certainly it would be an, an added attraction and what has happened just in the past you know, year here to change this? Well, g going back some ways, uh, a, a taxpayer who met the requirements for the federal statute but did not meet the requirements for the California break because the company d uh, wasn't primarily based in California uh, brought an action against the Franchise Tax Board uh, claiming that he too should be entitled to the benefit, that th that benefit limited only to California-based companies violated the, the Commerce Clause of the United States Constitution. Uh, that, that case went up through the courts over the years, and in August of 2012, uh, the Court of Appeal in California decided that the statute was unconstitutional as applied to that taxpayer and ba basically sent it back to the lower court to determine what a remedy should be. That is, the, to come up with some remedy that would put investments in non-California entities on the same basis as investments in California-based entities. Now, rather than waiting for the court to come up with a remedy, which could have been to give all of uh, or investors in non-California-based companies the same tax break that investors in California companies got, and, and there were concerns that at, at a time that the, the, the state's finances are not in great shape, that all of a sudden there would be many claims for refunds for, from California investors who had invested in companies that met the federal criteria but not the California criteria, and that all of these refund claims would, would result in a lot of money getting spilled out of the, uh, the, the, the California state coffers. Um, the, the, the Franchise Tax Board, the primary uh, collection, uh, tax collection agent in California, uh, then faced with that dilemma, took a, a very proactive step of, of putting out a notice 
explaining how they were going to interpret this unconstitutionality of this statute. And instead of giving the break to investors in companies that were not based in California, they basically threw out the whole statute and said the break does not apply to investors in companies that met the, the requirements of being based primarily in, in, in California. And therefore, they've put everyone on notice that with respect to tax years 2008 and later, anyone who claimed this break on their California tax return during those years is going to get a, a deficiency notice and, and be assessed for back taxes uh, plus interest. Uh, anyone who had a, a, a sale of qualified small business company stock in, in 2012, they've been put on notice not, not to claim the break, and if they didn't have sufficient taxes paid during the year, they could have uh, penalties for underpayment of taxes in 2012. But in, in effect, the, the, the tax collector, the Franchise Tax Board, lost a case, and, but in losing the case decided that they would take a very proactive step of turning it into a, a tax collection uh, bonanza rather than just uh, turn it, it becoming a, a, a big refund uh, uh, lineup. So they took this aggressive stance, you know, saying that they're going to collect this money from the mm -hmm. other people rather than have to pay it out to a bunch of new people. Right. And, and again, the court in the case had suggested that there were three possible remedies and actually sent it back to the lower court to determine the appropriate remedy in that particular case. One would be to give the tax break to, to all investors that met that requirement, whether or not the company was based in California. Another would be to disallow the, the, um, the break to all investors wherever the, in, in effect, even those who were invested in California, or to come up with some uh, combination of the two that in effect put all companies on the same footing, that is that then the California-based companies would not have an advantage with respect to this tax break over non-California companies in pursuing investment from California investors, who of course are the, the, the California taxpayers. So uh, a, a, again, they um, de determined rather than to battle this on in the courts and in effect wait for a number of taxpayers to, to step in and, and start claiming refunds that they would take this very aggressive step. So who is this impacting primarily? Well, this is primarily impacting uh, individual investors in California who are investing either as angel investors or through partnerships in California-based companies who thought that uh, a good portion of the, the gain on sale of these companies would not be subject to tax, or that they could take their the, the, the gains from the, the companies they invested in that were big winners and reinvest them in other qualifying small business companies, in effect, continue to roll over their angel or, or venture investments from company to company as, as they became successful and, and got to the next level, cash out and, and roll in. And the, you know, many of those individual investors um, may have a, a, a long series of investments where they've built up a lot of gains over the years that now are they're going to be taxed on retroactively, even though they may have taken all of that money, put it into a new startup. It, it may be tied up in there. They may not have the the, the funds in their bank accounts to, to pay some of the taxes in this regard. And this is for individual taxpayers. This doesn't impact venture capital firms? Well, th this is a break only for individual taxpayers, but it applies to investments made through partnerships as well. But it's the individual who gets, gets the tax break. Um, if investments were made through a limited liability company in California, there is a a tax on limited liability companies to the extent that this would increase the income of one of those. It could push them into a higher tax tax rate as, as well. But it's, it's primarily a hit on individual investors, whether they're making the investments directly or, or, th or through a, a pass-through type entity, a partnership type entity. Do you have any idea of how much money the Franchise Tax Board stands to make once everybody pays these taxes if this indeed, you know, is... Uh, I, to be honest with you, I don't have figures on that, but I, uh, the, the, 
the case that they were dealing with was several hundred thousand dollars of taxes involved by that one taxpayer. Uh, I've seen some situations, with clients that I've worked with, where it is hundreds of thousands of dollars for an, an individual investor. So it's, uh, again, I don't know what the total numbers are. We'll find out when they start sending out uh, assessment notices, but it's, it's a big number. When are they expected to start sending out these assessment notices? Well, uh, they, they better get on it quickly because they, they left things open for 2008 because that's the, the last year for which this, or the earliest year for which the statute of limitations is still open. Statute of limitations on 2008 tax returns will start to expire on uh, April 15 of 2013. So if they're going to collect any assessments from the 2008 year, which is the earliest year that's still open, they would have to get those assessments out by April 15 of this year. So uh, we should be expecting them shortly. What's the response that you've seen to, to this ruling? Well, again, a lot of uh, investors have questions about what they should do. The, in, in the notice, the Franchise Tax Board uh, suggests that all these taxpayers who have taken this benefit should step forward voluntarily file amended tax returns or, or prepay the taxes they're going to be assessed so that t to help the, the tax collector out. I think most people are taking more of a wait and see attitude to see if the assessments do actually get out by April 15 if, if they have a 2008 year issue um, to see what the next step is in, in the courts, both in the, 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 the Cutler case, which is the case that was decided back in August, and in any uh, additional litigation. I would expect there to be a, a significant amount of litigation over this issue. So there's a chance that this assessment isn't going to go through exactly as it's written now? Well, the Franchise Tax Board will send out assessments based on what they've said, assuming that they can get all the information together and track all these people down. They will send out the assessments. The question is what happens then? The taxpayers many of them will pay the assessments and, and then file likely refund claims and then take it into the court to, to sue for refunds. And we'll have some cases on that for, for years to come. The Cutler case itself was based on a sale of stock in 1998. It took it, what, 14 years to get through the court system before we got a court of appeal decision in 2012. So this. This, this is something that we'll be hearing about for years to come. What's your personal uh, opinion of this decision? Uh, I, I guess my, my concern is that it, it will stick as it is. I, I, the, the Court of Appeal decision, I'm not sure I would agree that that was rightfully decided, but the Franchise Tax Board chose not to petition the, the California Supreme Court to to, to review that case. Uh, it may be unlikely that the California Supreme Court would have taken it up anyway. So instead of, of pushing that forward, they just accepted the unconstitutional decision and then made, made the best of it. Uh, so we're, we're stuck with that. I don't see that uh, getting changed. So the, the question is, what is the appropriate remedy? The Franchise Tax Board has a great deal of discretion in the interpretation of the California tax laws. Uh, although the court didn't agree with them on the constitutionality of this provision, uh, they may agree with them on the, the, the remedy. But it's, it's really a question of, of what is the right remedy when this particular statute is declared unconstitutional. And it's usually the courts that will then decide the remedy, whether they throw out the whole statute, which is what the Franchise Tax Board has done, or whether they just throw out the piece of it that they've determined is unconstitutional, which is the limitation to uh, the California-based uh, uh, companies. Uh, they could say, well, we should just throw out that little piece of it, and the rest of it is fine. The rest of it tracks the, the federal statute, and we're just giving people at the California level the same break that, that they have at the, at the federal level. Uh, there are many constitutional scholars have views on how best to to deal with an unconstitutional statute, whether the whole statute goes out or whether you, you try to excise a piece of it here. Again, the Franchise Tax Board didn't wait for the courts to, to make that decision. They've come in with their own decision, and we'll see if the courts agree with that decision. Uh, from a legislative standpoint, um, 
this is probably not something that the California legislature is, is going to jump into at this point, although once this is resolved, they may have to decide whether they, they would provide some prospective break for investments in small business companies. But uh, uh, in today's world, where the, the California legislature has been in the budget battles year after year trying to find enough revenues, I doubt that they're going to turn around and give away a lot of revenues just immediately. Again, we'll have to see where, where that goes from a legislative standpoint as well. And based on your conversations with clients, um, if this assessment does go through exactly as it's been written and said, what impact do you think this could have on the tech industry and, and the investment space here in California? Well, ag again, I don't think most investment is driven by this particular tax break, but th this is th the second time that a small business tax incentive in California has been in effect eviscerated by the, the, the courts and then the Franchise Tax Board uh, uh, interpretation of the court's decision. There was an earlier statute back in the in the 1980s giving tax breaks that that went by the wayside as a result of court and franchise tax board action. So I, I, I think to the extent that a company is thinking about starting up in California or some other state, certainly they they will say, well, in another state there may be some tax break there. For example, the state may follow the, the federal rule or the state like Nevada or Washington may have no income tax. So uh, California income taxes are becoming more significant and I think companies are taking that into account and certainly although this is not a tax on the company itself, it's a tax on the investors in the company. It's one more thing to encourage companies to at least look around to other locations before deciding where, where to to, to have their operations. Now, if there are investors out there who are hearing about this and objecting to it, is there any recourse for them? Is there any plan of action that, that you see? Well, again, the plan of action would be first to go to the, the state legislature and try to have them fashion a, a, a uh, resolution of, of how the statute should be applied now that a court has said a piece of it is unconstitutional. That would be one approach. Uh, for, for most people, though, it will be those people who have been affected by it, who, who took the tax break sometime between 2008 and 2012, or expected it in 2012, and they either get their assessment or they voluntarily go in and, and file an amended return, and then it's a question of of doing battle after the receipt of the assessment. And is there any way that we can reach out to Frank Cutler and tell him thanks <laughs> or no thanks? <laughs> uh, I, Frank Cutler, his, his law firm, they obviously were successful for Frank, but uh, in, in doing so, it's, it's sort of turned the whole uh, investment tax result in California on, on its head. So that's where we are. Interesting stuff. Well, David Herbst, it sounds like this is not the end of the road for this story. We, we will be hearing about this for, I would expect, you know, several years to come, if not much longer than that. Thank you for coming by and shedding light on the whole situation. Oh, my pleasure.